Okay. Hi guys. So today I'm going to be talking about modeling the opioid epidemic in the U.S. So for decades now, the U.S. has been battling an ongoing opioid epidemic. Let me move the Zoom thing here. Uh, it started in the 90s when there was a rise in prescribing opioids. And in fact, uh, prescription opioids distributed by pharmacies nearly tripled from 1991 to 2011. This was followed by a rise in overdoses. In fact, there were six times as many uh, drug overdoses in 2021 as there was in 1999, and 75% of these overdoses involved some sort of opioid. By 2017, the Department of Health and Human Services had declared uh, the opioid epidemic a public health emergency. Um, so as of 2020, the most uh, common source that people are getting uh, their pain relievers, their prescription opioids that they're misusing is from a friend or family member. And so whether this is being given some sort of leftover prescription or stealing it out of someone's cupboard. And the second most common source that people are getting these prescriptions that they're misusing is from a uh, prescription itself. And so because uh, these are from a doctor, people think that they're safe and non-addictive, and that's not always the case. Um, as people take more and more prescription opioids, their tolerance can increase, and this can lead to uh, needing higher and higher doses which can lead people to switching over to fentanyl or heroin. And so this is because it's a cheaper option and also a more readily available option because you don't actually need a prescription to, in order to get these. If you're not familiar with fentanyl, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is up to 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. And it's a major contributor right now in the U.S. to both fatal and non-fatal overdoses. And so fentanyl is added to other illicitly made drugs in unknown quantities, and this makes the drugs cheaper and more powerful, but can also make them more dangerous because people don't know in what quantities fentanyl was added to their drugs. Someone might take heroin one day and be totally fine and then try to take that same amount the next day and overdose because they didn't realize that that uh, second one that they took was laced with a fatal amount of fentanyl. So uh, the opioid epidemic uh, can be kind of broken into these three waves. So right here we have, um, the like I said before, in the 90s, we started to see a rise in prescribing opioids, and this was followed by a rise in prescription opioid overdose deaths. Then people kind of started to switch over to heroin. So in 2010 is when we start to see that rise in heroin overdose deaths. And right now we're in the third wave where we started to see a rise in synthetic opioids. So synthetic opioids being fentanyl, overdose deaths in 2013. And around this 2015, 2016 is when we kind of see fentanyl overdose deaths surpass both uh, prescription opioids and also heroin uh, deaths as well. Uh, one phrase I'm going to be using a lot throughout this presentation is substance use disorder or opioid use disorder. So I think it's important that we go ahead and define what that means here right now. So substance use disorder is defined as a cluster of psychological, behavioral, and cognitive symptoms associated with the continued use of substances despite having substance-related problems, distress, or impairment. So over here, we have the 11 criteria used to diagnose substance use di disorder. And if anyone meets at least two or more of these criteria, they're considered to have at least a mild case of substance use disorder. Another word that you guys might hear often is addiction. And so addiction is considered the most severe case of substance use disorder. Uh, but addiction can also have a lot of negative connotation and stigma associated with it as well. But in this presentation, we're going to be using the phrase substance use disorder. So the goal of the work that I'm doing right now is to create a model for prescription opioid and fentanyl heroin use disorder, along with overdoses, to better understand how the opioid epidemic affects a particular community and a vulnerable subcommunity. And so in particular, what we're interested in asking is how do the two big risk factors of substance abuse being the availability of the substance, so it's going to be your prescription opioids, your fentanyl, your heroin, 
and also the availability of additional helpful resources such as therapy, physical therapy, medical care, et cetera. So how do these two big risk factors of substance abuse affect the opioid epidemic in our vulnerable subcommunity? So to answer this, we're gonna start by looking at this mo uh, compartment model from Phillips et al. So you can kind of think of this with epidemiology when you have SIR models. So in this first compartment here, that's gonna be our susceptible individuals. So those are people not taking any kind of opioid. They don't have a prescription for opioid. They're not misusing any kind of opioid. Uh, this over here is going to be our uh, people that have a prescription for opioids, but do not have opioid use disorder. We then have those that have prescription opioid use disorder, those that have fentanyl or heroin use disorder, and those that have stably recovered from opioid use disorder. And so let's kind of go over how this model works here. So we have our susceptible individuals being prescribed uh, prescription for opioids and then stopping that prescription without developing any kind of opioid use disorder. We then have those with prescription for opioids developing prescription opioid use disorder from their own prescriptions. And then we have those in our susceptible class here developing prescription opioid use disorder. And that can be through interactions with people that have uh, opioid prescription opioid use disorder or through interactions that with people that have a prescription for opioids. Because remember, we said the most common source people are getting these uh, pain relievers that they're misusing is from a friend or family member with a prescription. So then we have people transitioning over to our fentanyl heroin use disorder, and that's gonna be through interactions with people that have fentanyl heroin use disorder. And finally, we have our opioid use disorder classes recovering and then also relapsing. So this is going to be a closed model. So all of our deaths are gonna go back into our susceptible class here. And you'll notice that our opioid use disorders classes here have these additional death rates associated with them as well. So that's gonna be the basis for our model here. And then, so basis for our community model, I should say. And then we're going to have an additional model over here that's going to be our subcommunity. And again, we have susceptible individuals, those that have a prescription for opioids, those that have an opioid use disorder, and those who have stably recovered. And so remember the first part of the question that we wanted to answer was, how does the availability of the substance affect the opioid epidemic in the subcommunity? So in order to do that, uh, what we have here is that some of these rates in our subcommunity model over here, specifically the ones transitioning to uh, having an opioid use disorder, are going to be dependent on what's happening in our community model over here. So for example, here we have those that have a prescription for opioids transitioning to having a fentanyl or heroin use disorder, and that's going to be dependent on FC, and so that's going to be dependent on the proportion of our community, oops, I lost this thing, proportion of our community that has fentanyl heroin use disorder. So the other part of our question was, how does the availability of additional helpful resources affect the opioid epidemic in the subcommunity? So in order to answer this, you probably noticed on the previous slide, but we have two susceptible classes here. So we've broken our susceptibles into those without pain and those with pain. And so this offers an additional path from being susceptible with pain to being susceptible without pain without having to go through this route of being prescribed opioids. And so that's going to keep the number of prescriptions in the prescriptions for opioids in the subcommunity down. And then so we have this parameter tau here, which is going to be a metric for the availability of resources to our subcommunity. So, for example, maybe uh, their availability to physical therapy. So we are currently using data from the Knoxville Metropolitan Statistical Area for 2016 to 2019. And then using this data along with the method of least squares, we're able to obtain parameters for our model. And what you see over here is the solution to that. 
So on the top here, we have the community models or the community solutions. And then on the bottom here, we have the sub-community solutions. And so these are susceptible individuals, those that have a prescription for opioids, and those that have a substance use disorder or are recovered from that. And so right now, these are just preliminary results based on community level data only. And right now, the subcommunity parameters are just based on the community parameters or just given some value for now. But uh, we can kind of consider this a base and then can start to ask additional questions. So kind of going back to the question that we wanted to answer to begin with. So what if, for example, our uh, community has some targeted helpful resources, such as maybe they have additional access to physical therapy that the surrounding community doesn't necessarily have? So what we've done here then is tried to answer that question. So we've increased that tau, which was our additional helpful resources parameter. And so this is what we get here. And just to make it a little bit easier to see the difference. So this was uh, kind of our base and this is with that tau, that additional helpful resources uh, increased on the bottom here. But both of these are our sub-community, putting them next to each other just so it's a little bit easier to see the difference. And so what we see is kind of what we might expect with, um, we notice that our susceptibles with pain and also our individuals, our susceptibles with pain being right here, and our individuals with prescription for opioid, we kind of see both of those get a little bit uh, lower than we see in um, when tau is not increased. Excuse me. And so we also see that our susceptibles without pain is a little bit higher than it is with when T is or when tau is not increased. One thing we do notice though is that our opioid use disorder classes here, along with uh, being recovered from opioid use disorders, those ones don't really change much at all. But you can kind of see that um, this starts to allow us to play around with this and ask some questions about how the community is affected by our subcommunity. And so next steps and future work that we want to do is we want to add in some subcommunity data. Remember I said the subcommunity is just based on the community parameters for now. And also maybe kind of adding in some more complexity to some of our parameters, maybe making them non-constant or non-linear, just to make it fit the data a little bit better. Another thing you guys might have noticed is um, we are only, uh, the data was only up to 2019. And that's because there's some kind of drastic changes between pre and post COVID. Um, before COVID, we were seeing a decline in the number of overdoses associated with uh, opioids. But unfortunately, since COVID, that has started to rise once again. So we need to determine what's going to be the best approach to model kind of these drastic changes between pre and post COVID. But once we've done all that and analyzed this model, we want to uh, begin to partition some of these classes even more. Something we're looking at adding, or something that would be interesting to add into this model next would be to look at also adding in benzodiazepines. So this is something that people take to relieve uh, stress or anxiety or help them sleep. But if you're taking benzodiazepines along with opioids, this leads to a much higher chance of overdosing. So that's kind of a direction that we'd like to do after this. But that's pretty much all I have. I'd like to thank uh, my advisor, Dr. Strickland, over at the University of Tennessee. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the people that we're working with at uh, Veterans Affairs and Oak Ridge National Lab, along with the other people that we're working with at the University of Tennessee. And thank you.